Welcome to a very unique and fun video talking about how to start your own metery. This is one video of many that you'll find all about the process of starting a metery. I have a fantastic mead maker and co-metery owner, Billy Belt with me here from Lost Cause Metery. He is in, or they are located in San Diego and it's their metery is world famous. That's not even a lie. I'm gonna have him talk about it, um, but Billy, welcome to this unique series. I am very curious to learn how to make a metery myself, and I have no doubt that people who are watching are very curious too. Would you mind talking about Lost Cause? Give us a little debriefing. Yeah, thanks, Garrett. Stoked to be here. Uh, so we are a metery uh, in San Diego. We opened our doors at the end of 2017. Um, we have two locations here and uh, just celebrated our our six year anniversary uh, last November. Um, we're, we're, during that time, we've become one of the most uh, awarded meteries in the world, uh, which has been rad. And um, yeah, we we make mead across a very wide style um, of meads. And what we try and do is just make world-class mead from dry and light and, and bubbly to intense, uh, you know, big, rich, dessert sipping meads, mm -hmm. um, fortified 20% meads, and everything in between. We have a lot of fun with um, with uh, mead making and getting creative in the different styles. So that's what we do. Um, you can find us online. We do uh, ship around the country. And uh, if you're ever in San Diego, come check us out. Come, yeah. come by the taste room. So you guys, you guys play in the whole sandbox. You don't just kind of sit in one little spot. I think that's really cool. And obviously that I think continues to qualify you to talk about what we're doing here today, which is opening a meadery, everything you really need to consider before you do so and while you're doing so. The intent of this whole series is for anyone who's listening, who started the process, who said, I want to do this. What do I do? you can hopefully find this multiple part series to help you along the way. So this will be split up into sections and I'll make sure that each video has the topics at hand for you if you're curious, if you go back or need to go forward and find things out. But before we get into part one, we, we have some things we have to consider before we even start putting pen to paper to uh, get this meadery thing going. So what do we need to consider before we get started in our mead making, sorry, meadery journey, not mead making journey? <laughs> yeah, well, that that um, that's exactly it, right? It's not a mead making journey anymore. Right. It is a meadery journey. And that's kind of the first hard truth that people need to um, realize and really process is that if you're going to own a meadery, uh, you are no longer, you're not going to spend your time being a mead maker primarily. Mm -hmm. Now, even if you are the head mead maker, which most of us are, uh, especially starting out the first few years, almost every meadery owner is also the, the mead maker. Um, but that's only a sliver of your time mm -hmm. to get a business off the ground. And as you become more successful, the less time you have to make mead, the more time you need to spend on the business. Um, I love it. I love being a business owner. It's rad. Uh, I do miss being in, in production all the time. I, I miss um, that part of it, but that's okay. The whole package is is worth it. Um, but I think people need to realize that you're, you're, you are going to be doing every single thing. You're a janitor. You're a um, accountant. You are a um, working with your community and politicians and every all everything in between, and sometimes you get to make mead. So <laughs> yeah, um, so that's one hard truth because if you just want to make mead, uh, you can get hired as a professional mead maker. We're we're an industry that's reaching that point, um, but maybe maybe owner isn't the right thing for you. So that's one hard truth. Um, another one that is uh, I think important for a lot of meadery owners to or potential meter owners to understand, you will be competing with breweries and wineries and cideries and distilleries. That's your competition, not meteries. Hmm. So that means you have to meet them at their level in terms of experience, tasting room, uh, in terms of 
uh, the product. Uh, people will need to um, choose your product over the best craft beer in town. You know, the wine they can get at the store, um, the, all the cocktails and canned cocktails that are coming out there. <laughs> yeah, And the, people, you, you really got to think about what that means because there's some um, uh, meter owners go into it thinking, well, it's meat. I can start with a much lower budget and uh, lower you know, um, expectations because people will come just because I, maybe I'm the only metery in town. You, I promise you, uh, and we'll talk about this later. You want more meteries close by. You're not competing with them. We're all in this together. You're competing with everyone else. So that's yeah, another, hard huh. that's interesting. Well, on that topic, you know, I feel like most people go the opposite way and are like, you know, I don't want to have a lot of competition especially because if there are really good meteries around you, then you're like, uh Oh, but that's really interesting. I'm glad you brought that up. And there's one more, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, and I'll, and I'll talk more about that, uh, uh, later on too. But the, the last one is, um, just know that whatever recipes you have, whatever styles of meat you're making now as a homemade maker, um, they may be great. They'll, those recipes will most likely be useless once you <laughs> launch and start selling to, uh, customers. And what I mean by that, not that they're bad recipes, you will learn so much about what people will actually pay for and mm-hmm. what actually moves in the market. Um, and you have to be able to pivot, which we'll also talk about later. So if you just, if you don't only have a few recipes and like, that's your thing, um, you, you're going to need more than that to, to succeed as, as a metery owner. So don't get stuck on just a couple recipes. Don't get stuck on, um, you know, perfecting one or two flagship recipes before you launch. That's not where you're going to be successful. You're, you'll be successful if you can make uh, a, a lot of different styles of mead well mm. and see what works for your business model, for your town, your city, whatever it is. Um, so those are kind of the three hard truths that I see some people don't maybe don't fully consider before they get into it, but they're really, really important. Yeah. Well, and those are all, I feel like those are all mental blocks you have to set up before we go into part one, which we're about to go into, but the, the hard truths, I love that you started with that. So these are hard truths because all of us who are uh, hoping to go on the endeavor of a mead making a uh, profes- professional mead making journey, not just home mead maker, um, sometimes it is easy to think about that you're just, I'm just going to make the mead. It's like, no, there's a lot more. And we're going to talk about that. So let's go ahead and get into the weeds a little bit with our first main topic. Now we're going to have, again, multiple parts of this. And our first one today, our first part here is a, all about a business model. And as we kind of did a, a chat before this time about you know outlining these things, you had talked a little bit about different business models to build your whole business off of and you mentioned some fun ones so i'm gonna go ahead and pass it to you what what do you mean by business model what are people thinking about whenever they are diving deep yeah so this is really really important for um metery owners especially it's actually understanding um, and choosing the right business model is critical because that will dictate all the other major decisions that come after that. And it, it, it's one of the first things you have to understand. Um, it's also where a lot of meteries uh, struggle because we don't have a uh, long, um, you know, proven industry yet. Uh, not, not, not really at a, at a national or international scale, um, or at least, at least it went away for a long time. Right. So mm-hmm. unless you're in uh, uh Poland or Ethiopia, you know, meat is just now making a resurgence. And so many meteries are, I mean, it's the last 10, 15 years we've been doing this. Um, and so a lot of us are borrowing business models from other uh, people in our, our industry, breweries, wineries, uh, bars. And that's great. Um, but you have to know what will work and why, and not just borrow a business model because it worked for a brewery or a winery. And it's because you can really, really get tripped up with mead. Um, Brewery owners, when they want to start a brewery, they have a very clear path, right? 
uh, these business models work. These have been proven. Mm. You know, this one worked, uh, you know, this brew pub model um, works like this. And this, like, uh, you know, hypey, you know, line out the door, uh, um, new release every new hazy IPA every Saturday model works like this. Mm. Um or like big production brewery, this this model works like this. You have people you can ask, numbers you can get, um, and same with wineries, meteries don't have that. So uh, so you have to really understand a lot of times as a meadery, you're kind of picking and choosing and, and, and figuring out um, where you will have to end up and then what model will, will get you there. So if you look at like the classic brewery model, um, a lot of them are built on like high volume and repeat visits, right? Mm. Uh, a lot of craft breweries nowadays, um, they're becoming very localized and they're dependent on, you know, every day they're open. Mm. A lot of people are coming in, they're buying pints. It's a fun place to be um, relative to other like, like wineries. There's high volume, a lot of people consuming, you know, beer on premise. Mm -hmm. And uh, and they're coming back, right? If you find a brewery you love, um, you may be visiting there weekly, maybe maybe more. Uh, that's what they're dependent on, and that dictates what kind of equipment they buy, what kind of beers they make, how their tasting room is set up, if they even have a tasting room, all, uh, how they do their staffing, the investment and capital they needed. All of that was built on getting to that business model and, and wineries. Um, the classic winery model is a little different. It's it's in some ways the opposite. Uh, it's built on a low volume, lower volume, higher average sale, right? Mm -hmm. A lot of wineries are clustered in these uh, these these wine growing regions. Even even urban wineries like here in San Diego, um, they're built on getting people in, and you may not get them, you know, the same person a couple of times a week. Uh, it may be built around a lot of people um, coming for the summer and doing wine tasting, right? And a lot of tourism. You may, some, in a lot of, of these wine areas, you may only see them once or twice a year. Mm. So you got to get everything you can out of the customer during that visit. So that's why wine clubs are such a big thing, mm -hmm. right? You get them in, they love your wine, you sign them up. Now you have a customer for the, you know, every quarter you're sending them six bottles, Um and, and when they come in, maybe they're leaving with three bottles, which is very normal at a winery, mm -hmm. uh, much less so at, a, at your average brewery. So you have a higher average sale, uh, much lower volume of people visiting. And there's always tons of exceptions, but this is generally. Mm -hmm. um, and so what a winery does in terms of their um, how they operate and the investment capital, where it goes, what kind of equipment they need. Uh, their marketing, all that is dependent on that type of business model. Um, and, and so meteries can be a blend, um, but here's the key. Whatever you do, uh, it, it's like a um, your business model has to match everything else, right? So your business model has to match up with the style of mead you make. Mm. Uh, it's going to dictate how often you release new releases, um, the volume of mead you make, the, the type of packaging you do, your location, uh, the equipment you get, how you price your meads, everything. Um, and what I mean by that is, so if you are a, uh, let's take like a, a brewery model, let's say you want to, um, you want to replicate that as a meadery. You want to do High, high volume of visits uh, and um, you want people coming back, drinking on site, that kind of thing. Um, so that's going to dictate, uh, one, where you're set up, your location and what kind of space you get. You're going to need to really center it around a uh, tasting room. The more retail or, or walk-in mm -hmm. you know, location you can get, the better. If you're out in the middle of nowhere, uh, that's that's not going to like, like a destination type, type space isn't going to work for that model. Um, it's going to dictate how often you're releasing new meads. If you are relying mostly on high volume and tasting room, uh, you're going to need new releases all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, you can't just have, you know, a 
a couple flagships. Um, and that's why it doesn't work for wineries. Wineries release new wines a couple times a year. Right. And so there's really not a huge point in, in people coming back, you know, a couple of times you know, every week for whatever's new. Um, and it's going to line up with the kind of packaging you do uh, in, in everything. So um, it's almost like a um, like a matrix of decisions that will kind of they all have to come together. And your business model is like the thing that makes sure uh, that, that they're all aligned. Yeah. Right? And they're all working together. It almost sounds uh, like I don't mean to make the parallel, but beer strength is lower easier to churn out much easier to make lots of different things i would say at a lower lower abv you know you could have more releases and that wine higher strength yields to the the bottle club aspect when it comes to meat and and you guys do both um obviously like you said so do you find that within this business model idea that you have a little bit of both in your world because you have lower strength and you probably have lots of releases and you have people at a tasting room and like you have lots of capability for people to come in and try a lot of stuff or and uh, i think you have a bottle club too if i remember correctly so we we do yeah and that's why um you know that's why i say a lot of times a meter you're 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 picking and choosing different things based on what's going to work for you within the business model, create your own kind of business model. But yeah, we, um, so let's take a look at a couple of things because sometimes uh, you, it's not so much you choosing, but what is, there's there's other things in play that will dictate mm -hmm. what kind of business model you have. So uh, for us, for example, we're in San Diego, high population, mm -hmm. relative, mm -hmm. you know, big city. So that means we have the ability one to do a tasting room model. We don't have to be. We don't have to depend on um, distribution. Mm -hmm. Now, if we were in a small town in Iowa um, with a small population, we may not be able to rely so much on a tasting room. We right. may have to focus more on distribution. Now, for us, we do zero distribution, um, and uh, so part of that is also uh, I've just. I, I, I really wanted to push the taste room model, the, the, the be able to talk to consumers one-on-one. -on -one. Um, I also just hated giving up our, our meat at a discount to distributors. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, so, so I really pushed for this and we made it work. But what that meant was um, in order to not do distribution, uh, you know, we're in San Diego, we need people coming back. So that does dictate, um, yeah, we can't only have a few releases a year. Mm -hmm. The other thing we have to do is pull some of the wine business model because we're never going to get the traffic that a brewery does, no matter what kind of mead we make. So we have to increase that average sale. Uh, and so to do that, one, um, we it, it dictated the type of meads we ended up making. Mm -hmm. We started off with all draft, all carbonated, mm -hmm. like 10 to 12 percent off dry meads and they were great mm -hmm. people loved them what we realized is that um, as much as people loved them when we started making a few of the big like um, more intense rich barrel aged sipping meads and packaging them in a 375 bottles mm -hmm. people uh, would buy more of those to take home because it's so unique it's it's so it's something they would take home, share with their friends, share for a special experience. Mm -hmm. And so then we started realizing um, that's where we could uh, um, kind of have both. We have the tasting room, but we can we can uh, produce these more expensive meads and they're a lot more expensive to make. Yeah. Um, but you can you, you can get customers to take more of those home because they're just they're more unique than than if I made a um, you know a peach and lemon draft mead mm -hmm. eight percent off dry it's delicious right and maybe we get more people coming in to drink on site but maybe that's not unique enough that they're wanting to buy a case to bring home and mm -hmm. share with their friends at a bottle share but this you know Montmorency cherry and uh, Pasilla de Oaxaca chili mellow mel 
that is um, sweet and tart and smoky and intense, uh, that's something mm -hmm. really unique and people fall in love with it. And so that, so, so um, all those kind of that dictated what we did at the meadery and then what kind of meads we would make and then what equipment was needed for those meads. So it all really has to come together. And sometimes your, your location, like I said, like we're in San Diego that opened, it didn't really dictate what we did, but it opened an opportunity. We yeah. could do rely on the tasting room. Um, sometimes your, uh, where you are and, um, and in terms of like the policies or the state laws around alcohol mm -hmm. will dictate what you can do. Mm -hmm. um, things have changed a lot over the last 10 years, but there's a lot of states that used to not be able to do uh, make money doing tastings if they were a winery. Mm -hmm. And okay. so they were forced to do bottle sales. Um, in California, we can do direct distribution. So I can do self-distribution. Mm -hmm. A lot of states don't allow that. So that may dictate how whether or not you do distribution or not and what that looks like in terms of interesting wow. um you know your business model and can once you get your business model figured out then you can start to understand okay here's the equipment i need to make that happen here's the kind of space with these requirements that i need mm. to support that so we have a um for the amount of mead we we do and and kind of um um, how well we're known, we have a tiny space. Our production mm -hmm. facility is only, uh, you know, 1,500 square feet. And that's all we need because we, uh, when you're not doing distribution, you don't need the size. You're, you're, you're making 100% margin on your meads. Yeah. Um, so you can sell, make, produce less, sell less, mm -hmm. you know, at a higher margin. If, you're, if you are relying on distro and you're that um, owner in small town Iowa, uh, you're going to need more space because that's what distribution requires. Yeah. And um, you're going to need a certain kind of investment to get there. And uh, and so that dictates then that's part of your, your business model, right? So all yeah. these things play together. Is it? Yeah. Make yeah, it, this it, makes sense. Yeah. Well, um, I... I'm going back to the, the tasting room idea for a second. In my brain, this is naive brain of mine. I was like, well, you know, tasting rooms, that's like for draft meads. It's like... No, that's not necessarily true. You can still do a tasting room situation with things that are still in from bottles. It, it might be a different um, money wise. You might have to do things a little bit differently or, or you know, pouring wise because it might not be as clear, but it's still doable with still meads. So that's just a naive thought in, in my head. I was like, oh, yeah, you can only have a, a tasting room with carbonated stuff. Like, Wait, hold on. <laughs> that's not true. <laughs> so anyways, that's my own. Yeah. And that part of that is. Uh mentally tying the, that kind of taste room model to like the brewery model, yeah. you know? Um, but, but no, we, um, um, you can absolutely do a very successful tasting room with, let's say you do no draft meads and you do all intense. Um, and you know, still meads don't need to be, they can be bone dry too and light. Um, uh, but let's say you only want to, um, you're really focused on, making these big, intense mellow mills, maybe a barrel-aged program, a uh, higher ABV, you can absolutely have a tasting room that supports that 100% no distribution. But what that means is you're not going to get people coming in every week drinking that. So right. you have to have a business model that allows you to succeed built on that. That means you're going to want to go, um, you're really going to want to go heavily on a club, mm -hmm. right? Because you're going to want to be able to get these people in. And then when you do have something new, get it out to them mm. um, or have a way to communicate to, to bring them in. Yeah. Um, you're going to want to have some special tasting experiences and your your tasting room experience has to match that. Right. If you're going to have a higher price point mead, you, you can't just throw a piece of wood over, uh, you know, two barrels and call it, um, you know, a tasting room. Mm -hmm. So, um yeah, yeah, but you absolutely you absolutely can do that. Um you just have to build everything else around it. So I just to um if you think about the matrix, the things to, to kind of sum that part up, the things to consider, um location where you are, but also uh so so location where you are, population, you know, how close you are to um uh 
another larger population, new customers that would come in? Are you in a uh, area that just gets all the traffic during the summer? Mm. Um, you know, you may be in a small town, but maybe it's it's a destination for three months out of the year, and you make all your revenue then. And that's there's um, you know meteries like um, Silverhand and Ash House out on the uh, uh, Sap House and Silverhand on the East Coast that do that. Um, you, uh, but also location in terms of maybe you already have a building picked out or, or you have just a great opportunity. Maybe you, um, you have a family member that, that can get you in on a certain space that may dictate everything that you do, because if that space is 2000 square feet or 2,500 square feet, Mm -hmm. that is really going to dictate what kind of business model you have. You can't go in thinking you're going to do all this distribution everywhere and make all these draft needs, which require you know bigger tanks, more space. Um, you may need to make sure you can get by uh, doing smaller batches um, and getting the right price point for those batches. Um, so, so two thing, two location things to think about. Um, the style of mead, I would say, hopefully this doesn't dictate what you do because the other things will will kind of. Um, be more important. But if you are just set on a style of mead, like mm-hmm. you're like, I can't stand any residual sugar. I just want to make dry mm. sparkling meads. Um, you can absolutely make that work and be really successful. You just have to align your business model to that. You have mm. to know that you're probably going to be going for a um, more of a similar uh, to a brewery model, uh, high volume repeat customers. Um, so then you need to make sure you're in a area that can support that yeah um you know not a small town with the same people having to come in you know every day or it doesn't work um you may be limited by your uh your cash or investment which is a big thing usually usually that's really going to dictate what business model you start with um (laughs) and we'll talk about that that's part of our part of our next little ones too that'll be a topic we hit for sure yeah we'll really dive into that one um could be state laws like I talked about. And then any other um, like driving factors. So if you just don't want to be, or, or let's say that, let's say you really, you love the creative part of me making. And this is kind of why we ended up where we did. I I really don't like making uh, a recipe twice, mm. which yeah. is, I don't recommend as a business um uh, advice for for most people, but for us, we've made it work. I just love there, there's I, I mean our list of new ideas and new honeys to try and new things is, is endless, and mm-hmm. um, I just can't stand making something we've already made, and we don't get an opportunity to make something new and creative. So what that you know means for me is um, since I want to do that, I I'm not going to be as successful doing distribution. Distributors they want you know, if a product sells well, they want to rebuy that same product. Mm. Um, and so for us, that's another reason why we didn't do distribution. We just wanted to keep making new stuff and that worked for a tasting room and doesn't really work for distribution right. as much. So, okay. Well, that, I mean, that all makes sense to me. And um, so that's overarching. We just talked about business model ideas. And this again, this is pen to paper. Hopefully you're putting pen to paper or computer or something, writing down your ideas Get yourself set up on what you want to do. Take everything Billy said and kind of dwell on it and think about what you want to do. We're going to go ahead now. We're, not, we're going to, in the next part, we're going to talk about the business plan, not necessarily the model, but the business plan and actually funding the metery, which is um, obviously money. We'll get into that, into the weeds of that. But thank you, Billy, for educating us on the business model side and, uh, I hope that everyone will go ahead and click on to the next one whenever it's available for funding and the business plan. So let's go ahead and head over to that.